I'm with us here today at the Berlin Day of the Transport and Climate Change Week 2022. My name is Riedel and I'm the moderator for this session. Today we have an amazing panel on the challenge of getting to zero emissions in the freight transport sector. We will be talking about the big trends and the solutions we need to keep our eyes on if we want to succeed in fighting climate change. Our goal today is that you will walk away with something. A new idea, a fresh perspective, perhaps a stronger motivation. So here's the format to give you an idea of what to expect in the next 75 minutes. We will take a few moments to introduce my fellow panelists. And afterwards, they will give us their perspective yeah, on the decarbonization of the freight transport sector. They will talk about the high-level themes and solutions that we need to be thinking about in the future. And then we will be expanding our geographical horizons by inviting two more panelists to the stage um, from two of the world's most important emerging economies, India and China. And in between, we will always be taking time uh, to get your questions, yeah, because I would like to invite you to make this a very interactive conversation. So please don't be shy. Think about questions. Also, this goes to you, the online audience. Sounds good? Great. So let's get started with the panel introductions. Uh, Susan, I would like to start with you. Um, welcome. Um, you have a very interesting job title, I found. Yeah? You are uh, the Global Procurement Sustainability and Advocacy Leader at DAO, a multinational industrial corporation. Um, what exactly do you do there? <laughs> That's a very good question. So I'm leading our sustainable procurement program, but I think you, in my title, I have the word advocacy. So part of my role is to do things like this, right? And to talk about new ideas, push the frontier on what we can do from the procurement lens at a company like Dow. Okay, excellent. And how did you get there? How did you, how did you get into such kind of position? Well, I come from an academic background, so like Moritz, so I was at MIT before switching over to Dow about a year ago, and um, I guess I got lucky to find such an interesting role at a company like Dow, and my background is in supply chain sustainability and material science and transportation, so it's really a good fit with this company that is a material science company that contracts a lot of transportation, so. Exactly, yeah. Right, yeah, we're going to hear more, I think, about the specific activities of Dow later on, um, so stay tuned. Uh, Dr. Peterson, your qualification for being on this panel here today is that you are a professor, a professor uh, in sustainable supply chain practice at Kühne Logistics University in Hamburg. But not only that, you're also the academic director uh, at the Center of Sustainable Logistics and Supply Chains at the same university. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about the center and the work it does. Oh, yeah. So uh, first of all, thanks for inviting me. Fancy titles. As my daughter would say, I'm just a trucking expert. <laughs> That's how she introduces me to others. And she's right, because we do work on trucking, on logistics in, in general, on decarbonizing the, the sector. Um, in this center, um, we have two, well, two main perspectives. We do original research, right, what scientists do, but we have a large emphasis on transferring knowledge into the industry, because specifically in the, in the logistics industry, there is many things that are known already, right? but they are not used or done. So we'll see that in the presentation as well. There's transfer is important as well, and we focus on that. Great, so you work on this interface between exactly. science and, uh, yeah, and practice yes. uh, with policymakers and uh, the industry. That's really great. Um, I think then we are already at the point where I can hand over to you. Yeah, you will give us your perspective on why and also how uh, we must address greenhouse gas emissions from logistics. So uh, the floor is yours now, Mr. Peterson. All right, thank you very much. So I have, a, I have a timer here, that's new. As an academic, you're used to talk and talk and talk and talk until you're interrupted. So I try to keep to the 10 minutes. Um, we talk about climate change here, right? And it's, it's, we, we talk about it, it's pretty intangible right now. So um, Usually, I, I start with this, right? Sometimes you have to convince people still that climate change is real, but maybe to, to highlight again the urgency, right? The, all the weird weather we have in the past years, 
whether we have now in, in Pakistan and in India, um, that's just the result of a bit more than one degree temperature increase, right? And we heard a lot, a, a lot about targets, and I also like targets, and I also hope and are positive that we might achieve them. But the reality is that we're heading towards 2.5 degrees, maybe, maybe 2.8, whatever, but far from 1.5 right now. Um, so the logistics industry plays a large role in that because it's more or less 10% of the annual global CO2 emissions, but it doesn't look much better with the other greenhouse gases. And well, you could say 10%, okay, it's, it's just 10%. It's enormous, and there are two important factors to consider. When, when interpreting this 10%. Transportation, logistics in general, is still hardwired with fossil fuel usage, right? There is electrification, there might be hydrogen, there is SAF on super small scales. We burn fossil fuels on an insane scale, and we will do so in five and 10 years, right? So we're still super hardwired, and the sector is growing. Transport volumes keep growing everywhere not just in the emerging markets where there is maybe a justification for that, also here, right? If you look at the, how the traffic evolves on the roads in Germany, it's insane as well. Um, and maybe to put that into, into perspective in the nice graphics, which I just learned that Suzanne actually drafted that, um, from our friends at Smart Freight Center, the emissions, if we don't take meaningful action, not just targets, but implementation, plans, measures, uh, they will almost double until 2050 from that sector, right? So it's not that we're on the downturn already or have turned, um, but, but it's the trajectory is growth. So what can you do? The good news is there are many things that you could do, and we know what we can do already. So this is not something that research has to come up with. It's known for 20 years already. First field, so five principal fields. Um, Beyond efficiency, there's a question whether we can cut freight transport, right, by whatever measure, right? Transport less, and then you'll have less emissions. There might be, some years ago, we talked a lot about 3D printing as a solution. Well, it didn't really turn out, um, likely also not in the next 15 years, but there is a lot you could do to at least manage the freight growth we'll see. Sufficiency, right, questioning whether you actually need that. It's usually not in the hand of the logistics companies, but because transportation is derived demand, right? No one ever bought a ton of logistics. It's happening because there is supply and demand that needs to be served. That's the first field. The second, we've heard that, is modal shift, right? So whatever, whatever volume needs to be transported needs to be transported in a mode that is low carbon, as low carbon as possible. There are different options, whether you look at international transport or domestic, right? But that's, that's the second lever that we have. The third one, the vehicles that run in the best modes need to be fully loaded. And this sounds intuitive, but I can tell you, it's not the reality, right? So if you look at, at the trucks, on the, if you drive the Autobahn here in Germany, every fourth truck almost is empty, right? For reasons. So it's not that it's someone decides to do that, but there is an imbalance in supply demand. So there is a lot of room for improvement there as well. Fourth field, efficiency, right? And we'll hear about that later, I guess, as well. So uh, different measures that you could apply, making the, energy, uh, the, the engine more efficient, obviously, but also training your drivers. That's not done on a large scale. And if it's done, if, not, if it's not controlled, if there is an effect, Right? So that's stuff that has been in the books for I don't know how long, maybe as long as I live, uh, but, but it's not done on a larger scale. So there's a lot of things to, to simply do that's around. And then, at the end, have energy that's low carbon. And I don't want to go in the fight whether it's hydrogen or battery electric or biofuels or whatever. Right? It's, it will be everything. It must be everything at the same time. And then in these fields, you have different levers. You have operational levers, right? So how you, as a company, structure your operations. Uh, you have behavioral levers, um, ordering, right? How, how companies order, whether they, just like us consumers, wh whether we order in advance and, and in larger bulks or whatever we need in that same instance. There is obviously technology ingrained in all these fields. And in the end, and that's one of the themes here, right, it's, it's uh, regulation. And regulation or policy making or however you want to call it, has the ability to either speed that up or hamper it, 
right? I mean, I'm not from policy making. Most here are. I, I understand that you are all, almost uh, always positive about policy making, right? So there are many examples of failed pol policy making in, in transportation. And so this can also backfire and go into the wrong direction if not thought through. So these are the levers, and they are on the table. And we could simply <laughs> implement them. Um, the issue there, obviously, is that, that companies often don't have an incentive, right? Because the emissions, what is, what is these, wrong? External, these external costs are not uh, internalized uh, today. And yeah. when, we, when we come to that point, then many of these uh, levers might be pulled a bit more. Now, this is meant to be uh, as, as a, well, food for thought, right? So three thoughts on, from, from based on this now uh, for the future that I would like to share with you in the last three and a half minutes I'd, I have. Thought, for, thought one, speed and scale. If you look in the industry papers, also in the large newspapers, whatever, they're great examples no, from the industry, good. right? Okay, don't touch so it. of no new problem. fuels, of new vehicles, of, of things happening. And this might blind you a bit because it, it, it almost looks as if we're already there. So if you have these two examples here, three of the largest logistics companies in the world, Maersk ordered green methanol ships, um, Kühne Nagel and Lufthansa Cargo, they, they buy the annual production of a new facility that, that produces synthetic sustainable aviation fuels, so not, on bio, not biomass based, but synthetic. And these are great examples, and they comfort me, right? They, they give me positive feelings that we might get there, and then you look at the scale, and you find out that these eight vessels that will be in service in three years are 0.5 uh, one five percent of the global fleet only, and that even Maersk, and they are the front runners, I would say, um, coming from Hamburg. That's something I'm not really allowed to say because they were of Hapag Lloyd, but Maersk is really, really one of the most advanced players there. They don't even know where the green methanol will come from, right? You need the bunkering infrastructure, as we've heard, but you also need the fuel itself, and even for only for this eight vehicles, they don't know. And the Kuninagli example. Um, it's great that they started. The annual production of that facility is burnt within two hours in one B747. You have to start at zero, right? And it will be scaled up, but it shouldn't comfort you too much that there are solutions that are piloted, I would say, right? Still, we super heavily rely on, on fossil fuel. Second thought, measurement. And I say measurement, right? It's not that we actually measure it. Did you know that you can save 70, up to 70% of CO2 just by switching the carrier, the ocean carrier? They have an alliance, right? It's literally the same boat that you sail on with your box. But the one calculator from the one uh, company gives you a number that's 70% lower than the calculator from the other company. Great, right? It doesn't change anything, obviously. But it, so that, sh that showcases that there is a lot of room for improvement in calculation as well. We did a study. On, on road, and this is the numbers that I show you here. We heard already that the logistics industry is very different in its sectors. In road, you don't have these 10 large companies, but in Europe alone, 550,000 owner operators, right? So super small companies. We asked them in a larger survey how they, how they measure, if they measure, how they uh, interact with their um, partners, and 16% of the companies said, well, yes, we can calculate, and we do. 55% don't calculate anything, and it's really just t calculating fuel consumption with a factor, right? It's not, it's, it's super simple math. They don't do it, and why don't they do it? Because no one ever asks for that. Their supply chain partners are simply not interested at all. And why should they then, right? Second thought, this is an issue, and then in the last 15 seconds, we suffer from something in the industry here, maybe today as well, carbon tunnel vision, right? There are other problems also almost as important or as important. It doesn't matter really how, how you rank them, but it's not just carbon. And in logistics and transportation, we focus on that really much because that's something we feel we can measure and manage. But as you see there, biodiversity loss, air pollution. So there is, there's so much more to the global problems that this industry needs to face than carbon. And that's it. Only 20 seconds uh, above, above time. Thanks for, yeah, thanks for listening. Yeah, th thank you, Dr. Peterson. I think <laughs> you deserve an applause, exactly. 
Um, your students are very lucky to have a professor like you, certainly. Um, I'm not worried you anymore should ask about, them. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> about the uh, yeah, next generation of log logistics experts that run mm. through your school. Um, my question to you is, um, we, of course, have many countries in the world that are not like Germany, who has a super advanced logistics system, in fact, one of the most efficient. Uh, but whose logistic system is still developing and who want to improve their logistic performance? Mm. Um, what are good starting points for decarbonizations and what mistakes maybe should such countries avoid yeah, on their path to a, a zero carbon logistics? Yeah, I, I'm careful to say that there are any best practices that we should share. Uh, we should rather share what should not work. So getting, neglecting the railroad for decades, right, is something that we now struggle with a lot because the high level targets are put everything on the rail and do hydrogen, right? But the reality is the railroad in Germany is as it is, also in, in Europe as a whole. So that's, that's, I think, one pitfall that you should make if you have, mm -hmm. right, a, a system that works. Um, and the second one, and that's something that we've heard already a lot, and that's also maybe not the policy perspective, but rather from a company perspective, they realize that, well, infrastructure needs to be there, right? But the fuel needs to be there, not just the vehicles, but also the fuels, because changing transportation and changing energy supply are so closely connected. And this realization, I think, came quite late here for many uh, companies. Uh, that, that rely on the fuel, um, or would rely, but, but also in, in policy making. Right. Um, one more question to you. We still have time for one more. Um, as you mentioned, the freight sector is made up of uh, small and medium-sized enterprises. That's the same pattern all around the world. What can governments do to um, support these companies and to enable them uh, in this transition that, that needs to happen? Well, if you ask the companies, they ask for subsidies, right? And they get the subsidies with the, with the minister we have in place now because it's very car-centric and very truck-centric. Um, I would zoom out, we need a price on carbon, period. And then, and then the, the investments that need to be made, they, they can be calculated much better, right? So they have a long-term, the companies have a longer-term planning horizon because also the large ones, but the small ones. These new solutions are super expensive. We'll need incredible amounts of investments, finances to, to, to tackle that. And if there is a price, if, if at least a part of these external costs is internalized and factored into this um, calculations that we have, and then this money is going into the sector again, in setting, maybe that's something we'll hear from, from Suzanne, hopefully, a bit, um, right? As opposed to offsetting. Um, that's, that's a solution maybe, or a pathway. OK, thank you. Yeah, um, Susan, I think now let's turn our attention to you. Um, we already talked a little bit about it, that freight is very much a corporate world. Um, so now I'm excited to hear from you as a company that ships a lot of stuff around the world um, on the importance of corporate leadership, yeah, on collaboration along the supply chain, on better data structures, and perhaps some of the best practices that you have uh, in your company. So uh, please, we yeah, are excited for your keynote presentation. Thank you so much, Friedel, and thanks for the great uh, background, Moritz. And I think our, our presentations will be quite uh, in line with each other's outlook. So Moritz showed the tunnel vision of looking at climate, but kind of forgetting about everything else. Um, we try not to do that at Dow. So when I think about procurement sustainability, how do we buy things sustainably, I think we, we have to think of, there's many things under the umbrella there, right? There's issues like forced labor, child labor, slave labor, we can't tolerate in any form in the supply chain. There's biodiversity, fair trade, compliance. There's so many things we have to think about um, in the procurement department. And we can do that through the suppliers we choose to work with, the code of conduct that every supplier has to sign, our ESG program where we can influence and work with the suppliers, and then ESG data collection. So we are asking them for data. So we are for sure pushing for reporting of carbon emissions and other ESG criteria. But I know in practice, I'm, I'm one person, the procurement department is 500 people, 
We have 32,000 suppliers, right? And there are many crises going on that draw people's attention, right? Our procurement department has gone from the corona crisis to the Texas freeze was a big issue for Dow, um, the war in Ukraine, on and on. So there are things that grab everybody's attention in the moment that sometimes the climate crisis can feel a little bit far off or harder to integrate into the daily life. So that's what I'm here to continually remind people of. Um, so when we engage with our suppliers, um, one of my philosophies is to use programs, existing programs, to streamline the way we communicate with suppliers. So programs like CDP, the Carbon Disclosure Project, that has a uniform questionnaire about climate. EcoVadis is another uniform questionnaire that we can send to our suppliers. Together for Sustainability is a chemical sector industry group that has group audits that we can go together to suppliers to ask them to fill out one form, one way, try not to duplicate requests too much. So I think that's a really important way to go with suppliers that might say, oh, I don't really know how to do this, or it's hard. Let's not make it harder, right, by proliferating the different asks that we have. And when I ask our suppliers to fill out the CDP questionnaire, I get even more specific. So I ask for specific questions, like 4.1a, 5.2c. Like I tell them really, which questions am I gonna be looking for in your questionnaire? So if you're too busy, you've never done it before, you're not sure what to focus on, we kind of say there's five key things that I, I really need to see in the questionnaire. And one of those things, I have product carbon footprints on the list here, but for freight, that's a efficiency metric, like a CO2e per ton kilometer. So what is your freight intensity factor? And that's what we're looking to collect from our suppliers on an annual basis. Um, some suppliers are really good at that already, and some are just learning how to do that, and you know, it's, a, it's, it's something we need to grow. And we use the GLEC framework, the Global Logistics Emissions Council framework. Um, spoiler alert, I wrote it with my colleague, Alan Lewis, so I'm definitely biased here. Um, this is a little bit of an out of date slide because many, many companies use the framework by now. I think it's hundreds of companies, including Dow, that use this consistent framework for how to calculate freight transportation carbon emissions. Um, it was, put out by the Smart Freight Center in 2016 for the first time. So that was the first version, and then the second version came out in 2019. And it's just been building up you know, steam since then, and now it's on its way to becoming an ISO standard 14083. Um, I have to memorize that because, well, I wrote it. Um, but we ask all our suppliers to use the GLEC framework to calculate their transportation carbon emissions. We use it to calculate our scope three carbon emissions for freight transportation. And this is again going with the same idea of streamlining requests, asking the same question in the same way, trying to make things as uncomplicated as possible um, for something we know can feel kind of complicated. You know, what is it? how do you calculate your carbon emissions? Um, so if you haven't looked at it, I think it's a good start. It's the basis, CDP recommends it. It's the basis for the science-based targets for transportation. And why has this been so successful? Well, it's a collaboration. So it was written in collaboration with many, many companies, Dow being one of them, um, also governments, NGOs, stakeholders, SLOCAD, I think is in the mix here. Um, and that, that's why it works, these initiatives where companies come together and decide on the best practices, the best way to do things. Is it perfect? No, certainly everything can be improved, but we have to start somewhere and we have to learn and test these things and then we can continue to improve together. I want to mention another initiative that um, is related to this product carbon footprint or um, CO2 per ton kilometer, since we're talking about transportation, this idea of how do you calculate the intensity of the good or service that you're either procuring or selling. 
And the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, WBCSD, has started this Pathfinder project. I think they changed the name. I'm hesitating. It's a Partnership for Carbon Transparency. The PACT is now what it's called. But they, they published this Pathfinder framework last year, which is another methodology for how do you calculate a carbon footprint. And the GLEC framework is in there as the base methodology for transportation. So we're not reinventing a new thing. But, but this is another initiative I see as critical for how can we kind of get unstuck from this, um, you know, how do you compare one company to another? How do you compare one product for another? So my procurement staff that I work with can, can really do that assessment when they are looking for a new supplier. How do they know which one is better or worse than another? We need reliable KPIs, like carbon footprints, that we can compare one company to another. So when we think about procurement, um, you know, what can we do in Dow? We don't own any transportation assets. You know, we subcontract everything to our suppliers. Um, so we have a big role in encouraging and incentivizing our suppliers to change. Um, this is really important for us as we, you know, Dow needs to change our own operations, right? We have to work with our manufacturing facilities to decarbonize, but we need to also work with our supply chain. Th our scope three, our supply chain emissions are two thirds of Dow's climate impact. So we see it's a huge opportunity and also a big work to, to improve that. Um, so Moritz queued me up for, for this slide. Um, of kind of thinking differently, and this goes back to my work at MIT um, before joining Dow, but I started to think a lot about carbon offsets and how I could see more and more companies turning to offsets to reduce their transportation carbon emissions. So you can say the aviation sector is a good example of that, saying, well, we're just gonna buy offsets because there's nothing we can really do right now for to reduce our emissions. Um, but only about 2% of offset funding is spent on transportation projects. So I started to ask, why is that? Why, why can't we have more transportation offsets? And I, I don't know, right? Because there are many potential projects that could fit very well offset system. So I started to propose, and I'm still pushing on this topic of carbon insets. And if you haven't heard that term before, that basically is a carbon offset that is applied to either your own value chain or the sector from which your emissions are originating. So you're really kind of offsetting in your own supply chain. And there's a huge potential to grow this for transportation, I think, and we see companies starting to um, take that on to kind of selling certificates like for sustainable aviation fuel, or maybe you've seen some transportation companies come out with this concept, and I predict this will grow, and I hope that it does. And if you're curious to read more about what I've written on the topic, you can see my first kind of manifesto on this was in 2018, where I wanted to say carbon insets for freight transport decarbonization, but nature said, nobody knows that term, you can't call it that. So I couldn't call it that in that paper. You can see I called it that in my second paper on the topic um, where I talk about what are insets, how can they be used, and that has now advanced even further to an insetting guidance for sustainable aviation fuel. So I predict this will keep growing, I hope it does, and I wanna keep working on this topic. So I think I'll, I'll leave it there for now and I'm available um, for questions later, or, and now. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Susan. Thank you. Uh, really inspiring. I think um, there is definitely not a lack of frameworks and methodologies for uh, decarbonizing freight transport, but we have to get them to scale, right? We have to reach uh, throughout the different levels of supply chains to all the suppliers, to transport companies, uh, to use these frameworks that exist already. I think that's going to be the challenge. And in that context, I would like to ask you about the topic of digitalization. It's something that both of you haven't touched on, but which obviously has a very big impact on supply chains. So how can digitalization help us uh, to reduce emissions deeper and faster? 
Yeah, I, th I think there's a lot of opportunity there in terms of, you know, transportation companies can track very well their movements, how much fuel is used for different types of operations. Um, we also can track our shipments. We know what we shipped and where we're shipping them to. So Dow is quite advanced. We have a transportation carbon tracker that we use that we can see exactly what's, what's going on. But, but what we're really missing is that data from the suppliers to know for sure you know, that this is where we're estimating, right, at this point. And, and we'll only be measuring when our suppliers start to measure. So I think there's a huge opportunity there, anything from sensors to just a big data infrastructure, or maybe there's some AI that could be used there. But um, yeah, I think there's been an idea proposed to have a digital greenhouse gas protocol, so kind of a whole new system for tracking emissions for the digital age. And I, I think something like that would be very interesting. Okay, we have one question from the audience, um, which is about regionalization of supply chains. Of course, the corona crisis, Ukraine, everything has shown us how vulnerable global supply chains are. Um, is this something that you at Dow are also considering or already doing, yeah, to think more about localizing or regionalizing supply chains, which obviously also has an impact on the greenhouse gas emissions from the sector, from your operations? Yes and no. So I think in some senses that that has been a big movement to see what can we do more locally, how can we have shorter supply chains. But at the same time, when we think about supply chain resiliency, when we narrow down, and you know, that, that was a trend for a long time, having a single source supplier, but that isn't a resilient supply chain. So now we're kind of expanding, well, we shouldn't have just one supplier for certain materials. So we're kind of opening up a little bit more in that sense. Um, but I think maybe one issue is that uh, transportation isn't always the biggest part of the carbon footprint for the chemical sector, because we do ship primarily by ocean and rail, that, and mainly ocean. Um, so the intensity of the missions are, are smaller, um, but it's still important to always keep that in mind. All right, thank you. So um, we have been talking a little bit about policy. Now we have... Um, the privilege to have a real policy maker with us. Um, we have with us from India, the Honorable Special Secretary, Amrit Meena. Welcome to the stage with us. Um, you are heading a government agency, the Department for the Promotion of Industry and Internal Trade. Um, so, and you have decades of experience you know, with regional development, with infrastructure development, with trade, transport, logistics. Yeah? So you are definitely a very knowledgeable expert, and someone with also a lot of political decision-making power. Uh, so we are really exciting, uh, excited to have you with us here today and uh, have you join us our discussion. Um, we have reserved the next 15 to 20 minutes um, to exchange with you on modal shift. We have heard from uh, Artur Runge Metzger, modal shift is very important um, for decarbonizing the transport sector. Um, and that's also a topic that's very close to your work at your government department, uh, since your department is um, responsible for implementing India's national master plan for multimodal connectivity, called Gati Chakti, right? Um, so we are curious to hear from you uh, more about this master plan that you're responsible for. What are the vision and elements? Uh, to what extent is it maybe a paradigm shift for the rail transport industry, for the road transport industry, and how could this master plan help to make logistics in India more climate friendly? Please enlighten us. Thank you for the, thank you, uh, esteemed panelists. I'm grateful for uh, inviting our delegation to Transport and Climate Change Week. You know, uh, India's population is about 17% of the world population, and the contribution to the emission is 5%. Government of India is committed to achieve the net zero targets. Honorable Prime Minister during COP26 have made announcements. National Master Plan, which has very recently been uh, approved by the government, is based on the experience of uh, bringing in efficiency into the transportation and the freight movement. So the PM Gati Shakti National Master Plan 
is basically a transformative approach for integrated planning across different modes of the infrastructure, which includes railways, roadways, civil aviation, and also the mass transport, logistics, and all modes of the transports, wherein uh, the effort is to bring in uh, synchronized implementation so as to use optimally the resources. PM Gati Shakti National Master Plan is basically a digital platform wherein all data layers of existing infrastructure have been mapped onto a digital GIS based platform. The possible uh, areas from where the NOCs are required for execution of the project has also been mapped onto that, including the forest layer, the coastal regulation zone, and so on. Over 600 data layers are there into the digital uh, master plan. Any infrastructure ministry who is planning the infrastructure can plan the alignment in such a manner that there are minimum disruptions. So this will bring faster implementation of the project. And of course, the focus is on use of the green energy. You know, in 2014, uh, India was generating about 35 gigawatts uh, of the green energy. Now, uh, in last seven years, we are generating 110 gigawatt. And our Honorable Prime Minister has set a target of 500 gigawatt by 2030. So massive efforts are on for generation of the uh, non-fossil energy. The thrust uh, from modal shift from uh, road to rail is part of the National Master Plan. This is envisaged to be achieved through dedicated freight corridor network. In our country, presently about 65% of the freight is transported by the road. Around 28% is transported by the trains. But the train uh, passenger and freight movement is on the same track. Therefore, the freight movement uh, takes a little longer time compared to the passenger movement. The government has identified those routes on which the freight movement is relatively in higher volume, from Delhi to Mumbai. Mumbai is our major port, JNPT. And Delhi is uh, the hinterland, the capital city. And also from uh, Delhi to Kolkata. Uh, this is about 3,200 kilometer long uh, dedicated freight corridor, which has been thought of. Mumbai to Delhi is likely to be operational by mid next year. It's in very advanced stage. Part length is already operational. And the other Delhi to Kolkata also is in very advanced stage of the implementation. It is expected that once these dedicated freight corridors are functional, the shift of uh, modal shift from road to railway will be, uh, we will achieve about 40% uh, uh, modal uh, share of the railways. So that will add significantly to the carbon concern. Uh, in last uh, uh, seven years, there is about 40% growth of the freight uh, that is being carried by the railways. There is uh, focus on development of new inland waterways. Two of the waterways have been made operational in the last few years, and remaining uh, waterways have been identified. Work is going on. And we are hopeful then in times to come, the shift from road to rail will be there. And of course, the uh, road model uh, is also being developed into an efficient transportation, and there is exemplary thrust on electric mobility. So I'm hopeful that uh, in times to come, uh, we will achieve our targets. Thank you. Excellent. So this is certainly a very uh, ambitious initiative, um, but also very inspiring. Uh, grant plans. Um, and you're just at the beginning of implementation of this master plan. Um, certainly, there will be obstacles along the way. Um, so I would like to ask you, what will it take to make it work, and what obstacles do you expect or already encounter uh, in a, the implementation of the Gati Chakti Multimodal Connectivity Master Plan? See, uh, for any uh, ambitious plan, there are obstacles. But while formulating the plan itself, we have thought of the possible obstacles. And measures are already underway to see that there are minimum disruptions in, uh, in the implementation. Based on our experience, we, our government has been working on infrastructure development for last many years, with a special focus in last few years. 
Now, based on our experience, we have identified as to what are the possible areas of disruption. So, already systems and processes have been simplified and uh, efficiencies have been brought into for faster implementation and uh, without time and cost overrun implementation of the infrastructure projects. Uh, in our case, uh, uh, the decongestion of ports was a challenge. So under PM Gati Shakti, National Master Plan, mm -hmm. the first and foremost thrust is identified which are the links, the rail and roadway links, which are causing decongestion at the ports. So for all 28 ports in our country, an extensive audit has been undertaken and about 80 such projects, which are last mile connectivity projects, have been identified to be taken up on priority so that the movement of the freight from or to the port is in efficient manner. And uh, the dwell time in last few years, there is significant improve improvement in the dwell time uh, and the port clearing time. Excellent, very forward looking. Yeah. Um, Mr. Peterson, let's uh, compare this situation a little bit to Germany, which I think has also a modal share of rail and freight around 20%. Also has ambitious targets for decades already, mm -hmm. uh, but the share is not increasing. Uh, why is that? And yeah, what are obstacles that um, I, we commonly I, I encounter? Maybe a bit. We see political will. Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> we have decades. We've seen decades of transport and freight ministers that came from one political spectrum, and they're. They were very car-centric, very truck-centric. They had a master plan for rail, but I mean, having a plan is one thing, right? Following through and actually giving the money to the company that is in charge of that is another thing. Um, it's, it's certainly an issue of processes, how long it takes to build something here. I'm not sure how long it takes to build something in India. I would expect it's faster. Or at least, well, not the building process maybe, but at least the formal procedures that you have to go through. Mm -hmm. Well, and then will, right? It's, I, I think that makes the difference. Yes, political will obviously always is a super important ingredient for any transition or transformation. Um, Susan, what makes ra ra rail freight work for you at Doe? You already mentioned this is a very uh, important mode uh, in your company, but what is it that makes it so attractive uh, for your industry? I think it, it's a mode of transport that works very well for the chemical sector that, you know, tanks can go easily onto the train and then shift over to a truck. I think it's a, it's, there's a long standing relationship between the chemical sector and the rail um, sector. And we're constantly looking for ways to shift from trucks to trains. So that's a huge uh, initiative at Dow that we're doing that anywhere we can. And, and we have rail companies come to us and say, hey, what about shifting this lane over to rail? So we kind of get that. I can see it from the, you know, what companies try to sell us, right? Mm -hmm. So we see that, that companies, rail companies know this and they're, they're using this to expand their business. Um, if you think in the US context, almost all of the rail transportation, especially for freight, is, is diesel powered. So even though it is more efficient, we still have the issue of burning a lot of fossil fuel in the rail sector in the US in particular. Okay, and uh, since you are multinational corporations, I'm sure you also have operations in India. Um, and how, how do you, yeah, how does your company perceive this new, new master plan? Uh, what is your perspective on it? It's great news. We're very happy to hear that. And I think any time we can go by rail, it's certainly a, a good way to go. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, now let's open this conversation up a little bit to our audience. Uh, we have time for um, maybe one question here from the room. Uh, also for the online audience, please don't be shy to come forward with your questions. Um, if you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. We already have one. My question is to Susan. So what type of uh, or kinds of carbon insetting uh, projects are you considering at Dow? Thank you. I, I think that there's a lot of different projects. So we can think of it ourselves for our own products. But if we look at what we're kind of getting from our suppliers, our transportation suppliers, they're mainly related to biofuel 
So kind of a certificate-based system to introduce biofuel, whether in a ship or a plane, which Dow doesn't ship that many things by plane, but um, we do see that coming now, a certificate-based approach for, for biofuel. Um, and I did get a, um, a rail company offering a, actually a carbon offset for avoided emissions. So they're offering, if we switch from truck to their train, they would procure carbon offsets to, to represent these avoided emissions and then retire them kind of in our honor. So we see these things coming and I really wanna support, you know, how, how we can um, have more of them, but also how we can fund them through mechanisms outside of procurement. So procurement, it might mean a cost increase, but, but if we're also buying carbon offsets, maybe there's a way to connect offset funding to pay for these type of certificates. Okay, I think we have uh, one question from the audience, uh, from the online audience, actually, to, to you, Mr. Mina. Yeah. Um, it is concerning rail electrification. Yeah? What percentage of rail in India is already electrified and what kind of targets do you maybe have in that regard? See, uh, earlier speaker, Sri O.P. Agrawalji, he has mentioned that we will be electrifying all our tracks by 2023. In my delegation, we have officer from railway, Jivisha, and our honorable prime minister, uh, has uh, uh, mentioned and uh, uh, see we have uh, f uh, set by 2030 mode of uh, transport by railway net zero targets and in the COP26 Honorable Prime Minister has also announced about this 500 gigawatt by 2030. 50% of our total energy requirement will come from renewable by 2030. Our uh, uh, Carbon intensity in the economy will be reduced by 45% by 2030. And we have targeted for uh, reduction of 100 billion carbon emission by 2030. And by 2070, we intend to achieve net zero. So these are five nectar elements of our planning, which is called Panch Tantra. Okay. Vicious goals, yeah, and political will, yes. amazing. Um, we have time for... 100% next year electrified, that's quite oh, a difference yes. to, yes. to Germany. So that's really, I'm, I'm, you have to stress that, right? Because here in Germany, that's something yeah. we... There has been would great like to focus at some point. for the last few years, great focus on electrification of railway tracks. Fantastic. How is it in Germany? How much what shares well, electrified? They, they they are smart. They they differentiate between whether it's passenger passenger trains and freight trains and which volume goes over which part. I, ca I can't say it's not. It's it's close to, depending on how you measure it, seventy percent or something. Mm -hmm. um, but so there's a lot of, especially in freight trains, a lot of diesel being burned still. That's not something you can see when you look at the green containers in front of the DB building here at Potsdamer Platz, right? Um, and also you can't see that. Well, Deutsche Bahn is one of the largest Kohleverstroma, right? So they burn a lot of coal for electricity generation still. That's also something you cannot see. So, yeah, room to go also there. Mm -hmm. And what about the United States? Yeah, your country of origin. Oh, uh, for electrifying the rail? Mm -hmm. mm. Mm, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Don't know. <laughs> I, I won't ask any further. Okay. <laughs> um, Excellent. I think we have one more question for you, Mr. Mina, from the uh, virtual audience. Uh, it's about the electric two- and three-wheelers. Yeah, which role could they play in like last-mile deliveries? Yeah, because yeah, the last mile also has to be yeah. gone, yeah? not from the station yeah? to the industry, to the consumers. Um, are they also part of uh, the master plan or of any other government initiative? See, uh, Ministry of Road, Transport and Highways in Government of India has came, come out with regulations wherein uh, promotion of the electric vehicles, four vehicles, two vehicles, three vehicles, is going on extensively. Now, uh, most of the state governments have also come out with their uh, electric vehicle policy, highly supportive policies, both in terms of setting up of the charging infrastructure and also in terms of the taxation regime. So the adoption of EB in our country is expanding very fast. That's good to hear. Um, well, I'm afraid we have to conclude now this segment, our dialogue on multimodal freight, um, and move on. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Mina, for engaging in this important discussion with us. Um, you will now join the audience again and come back to us for the concluding segment. Uh, thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, 
our next topic is, is trucks. And in this context, we have learned from Mr. Peterson that increasing energy efficiency and fuel switch are uh, essential elements of the policy package. And let's make this a little bit more concrete um, by inviting Mr. Tianlin Nio from the International Council for Clean Transportation in China to the panel with us. Yeah. Hello, hello, everybody. Hello, Mr. Nio. Um, it's great to have you here. Um, you are not a policymaker but you are a policy influencer, one could say, because uh, you work for an international NGO yeah, that does a lot of advocacy yeah, for zero emission vehicles, quite successfully, actually, um, around the world. Um, so it's great to have you with us in our discussion today. Um, and if you don't mind, I would like to get right into the discussion with you. Um, yes. China is, of course, well known yeah, to be a lead market for zero emission cars. But what about the trucks? Yeah. What's the trend there in China? Um, do you see a growing market for zero emission trucks? And, and if yes, then um, what does government policy have to do with it? Yeah, uh, are there any support policies uh, that are behind the trend uh, that you are observing? So enlighten us with your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I've got a few slides for this presentation and uh, no, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I can't. He, I can't see my slides. So, is there anyone who's help, helping me to get it started? Yeah, that's coming. So, I'm got, I'm gonna talking about something in China. Uh, as as all of you will know, we, we have identified that heavy duty vehicles has, is contributing a lot of uh, pollutant emission, and especially carbon emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. So, we've identified two key measures for the heavy duty vehicles. Uh, as all of you may already aware of that. So first is to increase, uh, improve energy efficiency for the conventional heavy duties, uh, especially for the diesel for the diesel ones. So let's go to the first slide. So we have uh, already applied the three, uh, three stages of fuel consumption standard. And in one of our study, we analyze it through the te te technology potentials and uh, some future uh, vehicle taps and operational mode, and we, we found uh, for the uh, next generation, which is maybe the stage four fuel economy uh, standard in China, there is a potential to reduce the fuel consumption by 23% compared to stage three. And the figures showing here is the fuel standard for stage three fuel economy and for each uh, heavy duty vehicle type for each segment. And secondly, uh, I would say the uh, we also have a new testing cycle, uh, localized the China testing cycle, which uh, will apply to certify the fuel consumption for the heavy duty vehicles. So uh, a more tightened cycles and more localized uh, tycho, uh, cycle will make us like more uh, clear evaluate clear clearly know how much uh, the real uh, fuel economy is. So to provide some support for the decision makers. So, uh, I, and yeah, be, beyond that, we, we also, I think, uh, because because we already don't have a clear timeline for the new stage. So what, what we all know, what, what we know now is uh, we, the government is thinking about a better incentives for the effective and the essential technologies to improve the, uh, the energy efficiency at this stage. Um, yeah, so ne next, please. So the, the, the second key measure is to the is the electrification or promote the uh, zero emission heavy duty vehicles. So uh, so this uh, so the table in the left is showing the national levels targets uh, and also some local uh, announced uh, action plans in the next five years, actually from 2021 to 2025. So we have uh, a lot of targets on the heavy duty fleets, but uh, disappointingly, like uh, there is no very specific targets on heavy duty fleets, uh, especially the truck trailers, the dump trucks. Uh, only Hainan province have some targets for the freight. And seeing the right figure, you can see the 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 the, the electrification of trucks is still in the very starting point, uh, and and 
uh, still like in the short range and sh and the lightweight and the lightweight segment. So China is still focusing on how to promote the uh, highway segment heavy duty. So the the last slide, thanks. So the lastly, the next uh, policy will focus on the incentives, subsidies to uh, lower down the cost of uh, new energy vehicles. And also thinking about uh, how to, you know, how to aid uh, extra fees or extra uh, policies on the conventional vehicles to make the total cost of ownership uh, at the same stage. So in that way, or maybe lower cost for uh, new energy vehicles. So in that case, uh, we we can promote the battery vehicle and fuel cell vehicles better in China. So that's a brief. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Niu. Uh, very impressive policy insights from China. You mentioned um, fuel efficiency standards. You mentioned um, national and also local uh, city targets for zero emission trucks. And you mentioned um, also support policies yeah, for companies uh, so that you know, the, the cost of a zero emission trucks is going to be lower. Um, I, I'm, what I understand is that this is something that is still an early stage development in terms of the market. Um, what yeah. are the obstacles uh, for like a market rollout of zero emission trucks in China? How are the millions of small and medium sized enterprises uh, in this business um, yeah, dealing uh, with this emerging trend? Yes, so uh, you know the mode shift uh, in, in China is, is becoming very popular at this moment. So the a lot of uh, you know enterprises is 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 doing their way to moving a lot of uh, freight transport from trucks to to rail, as we dis uh, as 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 the experts discussed before, and also as I know, like we are working with a like a, we are working with smart freight center, like trying to uh, tr trying to you know promote some. Uh, small enterprises to set their actually they start from some large enterprises like uh, Nike. Uh, I, I can see one of that, but uh, still a lot. There is a lot of other enterprises have make their own you know internal goals about uh, the carbon emission reduction, the, the the targets for the enterprises, and also their own targets for a uh, percentage share of. Uh, new energy transport, uh, either for rail or uh, 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 especially for the trucks. So, uh, and 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 we are promoting some small enterprises to follow them, which means uh, they will like uh, not only starting to transfer some freight transport from truck to rail, but also and water, but also they will focus on uh, to electrify. Or using new energy or low emission trucks for their on-road freight, like like something like the last mile freight or something like uh, intercity freight. Yeah, so they were so some enterprises have, have already have their own goal on on this, uh, as I know. Thank you, Mr. New. Um, I turn again here to my panelists on this stage. Um, what can Germany or what can the U.S. learn from China in terms of electric trucks or, or zero emission trucks, um, what kind of policies um, do you know um, that we are implementing? Do you want to start? I, I would say a lot, but, but what would you be? I'll, I'll just say something briefly um, that I've kind of heard from, from other situations where if there's a new policy that comes that maybe makes an older class of truck obsolete, that sometimes they're shipped to Africa or another developing country, so they don't go out of commission, they're still used. So I think that's something we really need to be aware of, that if we're really switching to a cleaner technologies, then we need to absolutely switch worldwide, not just ship them off to another country. Mm -hmm. So the topic of scrappage programs, huh? make sure they're actually scrapped and not sold on. Yeah. So I, I would be I would have a question actually because I find these I, it, it might take a moment to take these numbers in that we <laughs> just saw because they were so many and uh, uh, yeah not uh, just quickly shown. So the scale up of battery electric vehicles is one thing, right? So so making companies buying them, 
but the scale of, of the charging infrastructure um, is something that we struggle here with, right? And we will struggle in the next year. So I, I would be interested in how, how that's, how's, how's that working in China? So I don't know if he's still here. Yes. Well. Yes. So, yeah. so, so in line with the, you know, the sales targets for uh, electric truck and fuel cell trucks, we, we have a lot of uh, projects like uh, uh, subsidies. You, you know, we are, we, are, we are moving the purchase subsidies uh, to the infrastructure subsidies. So in line with that, we were also giving some targets for the charging infra uh, infrastructures. So uh, a lot of projects or uh, documents are putting the, the, the fleet targets and the infrastructure targets together. And one thing is we, we also have for, for fuel cell trucks, we also have a very large and just announced a hydrogen, national hydrogen program, which involved a lot of cities. So this, there is a high ambition on the city groups to be the first pilot cities to like you know to 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 develop the entire hydrogen supply chain, including the hydrogen station and uh, some you know has some some hydrogen refilling station. Uh, yes, so so this is uh, some something happened here. So uh, start from a national target. And, and and then to the pedal cities, yeah, uh, ha having some local targets, making, yeah. Thank you. Um, now we have time for some questions from the audience. Uh, please, again, raise your hand here in the room or uh, send us some questions online. Um, I saw a hand over here. Can we have the microphone, please? Uh, this is for Susan from Dow uh, Chemicals. My question is, uh, given the context of India where the government is very active in promoting uh, rail transport and maybe even short sea shipping, uh, what are the parameters that Dow would consider for this transition from road movements for hinterland transportation in India to rail-based? And how would you also incentivize your suppliers, which are in thousands in number, to utilize the infrastructure that is being created? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a great question. And, and I think when we make a switch to a different mode of transportation, it's often for a long period of time, right? It's, not, it's a big decision that maybe will um, go on for years. So it's, it's an analysis, right, in terms of of course, costs and quality and timeliness, the time that it takes. So, you know, you have to think about all the different factors. And of course, we want to have CO2 on the table next to all the different decision making factors. And that, that's a growing thing that we need to build, that ability to make carbon emissions part of the judgment and quantify that and, and put that in the rubric. Um, so I would say, you know, we all want that, but how, how does that work in practice when sometimes these other pressures feel more importantly, you know, costs and, and timeliness, that type of thing. So, um, and how to incentivize. We work with many carriers, but also many logistics service providers that are then subcontracting. So I think we look to those logistics service providers to help us to find these solutions that are out there in India or other places that they can tell us what, what's going on, what's the trend, where can we start to switch? You know, if India has electrified rail transport in next year, that's, I didn't know that. So that, that's fantastic to know and, and we can start kind of planning in that direction. So yeah, thanks for the question. We have one more. Uh we have 30 seconds left for one more question. Uh, we have one from the online audience uh, to you, Mr. New, um, yeah. about the emission reduction that we can expect from the uh, fuel efficiency standards for heavy duty vehicles in China. Obviously, China has a huge scale. Uh, so what are the CO2 reductions that we can uh, hope for? Um, yes, so uh, actually for, for this moment, like, uh, we are also doing some emission studies and also a lot of uh, uh, also cooperating with China, some, some, some Chinese stakeholders. So our, uh, our 
uh, our attitude is, is positive. So under this ad adopted and, and also with some expected stringent uh, policies, we expected the uh, carbon picking targets will be uh, reached at 2030 and even before that. And also, you know, the China's uh, carbon neutrality target in 20, uh, 2060 will also, you know, be, re uh, be, be well, well also, uh, can, can also be achieved uh, like uh, from the heavy duty vehicle fleet. So yeah, we are positive on, on the emission reduction. Uh, yeah. I'm sure whether it's answers. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we need to move forward to the conclusion of, of our panel discussion. Mr. Neil, please stay with us. Um, I would also like to invite again the Honorable Secretary, uh, Special Secretary Mina uh, to join us here again on stage. Uh, welcome back, Mr. Mina. Um, so for the closing, I have the same two questions yeah, for each of my four panelists, and you only have to answer one of the two questions, yeah, not both. Well, but you can decide yourself which question is your favorite. Um, option, question option number one is, um, what gives you hope yeah, that at the moment yeah, that the transformation in the freight transport sector will succeed? Yeah? So give us all some hope. Option number two is, whether governments should aim to limit the growth of freight transport in their countries yeah, as a measure to reduce freight transport emissions. So um, each of you can maybe think for a moment which question you would like to pick. Um, and I will start with you, Mr. Mina. Yep. See, I am uh, very hopeful that uh, uh, we will all uh, taken together, you know, will improve. And uh, mm, as far as uh, India is concerned, the focus on the infrastructure, uh, with greater focus on the uh, rail and uh, the waterways, will definitely improve the situation. And also coupled with this, uh, the energy generation, the renewable energy generation, will bring in uh, this target of carbon zero emission, uh, a definite reality, I'm sure. Excellent. Um, now over to you, Susan. I'll, I'll go with hope um, and optimism, because I do feel that. Um, if I compare with 10 years ago when I started thinking about this topic, transportation wasn't always in the conversation. You know, we'd say, oh, well, that's not a big impact. We can leave that out or we're not sure what the emissions are. We can't quantify it, so we'll leave that aside. But now I think it's risen to everybody's top of mind and it's a huge, huge thing at Dow to think about transportation emissions and it's it's risen to the major importance and I think that that really reflects um, a lot of optimism that we can change and the, the the spotlight is on transportation you know here we have transport and climate week so I think when you have the energy and focus on a topic then we can make change more quickly mm -hmm. excellent Moritz you will get the final chance first right. uh, go to China uh, Mr. Neil <coughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm always I'm also optimistic, uh, optimistic and positive on, on this topic. So when the challenge come, will we not avoid that by you know reduce the freight, limit the freight? We just open to the growth as you know, especially in China, it drives the uh, the economy great uh, growth uh, very much. So we, uh, we 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 will you know be open to the growth of of freight. Not limit that, but find solutions to uh, to 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 you know to control the emissions, and a lot of studies and our policies has has shown very effective to you know control and reduce the emissions. So, yeah, and the transportation we we, we all believe in China. The transportation will have a great development and uh, meet the carbon targets in in the future. Thanks. Excellent, and uh, finally. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I'll go with the other question then to Thank be you. fair to the question, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so should governments try to curb freight transport, right, volumes? Um, yes and no. Yes, transport is too cheap, way too cheap. Uh, well, speaking now for, for Europe, right? It might be different in other parts of the world. But here it's way too cheap um, and that because it's derived demand, it's, it simply happens because it's economically feasible, right? And we see 
we see super strange things happening, stuff transported throughout Europe to, to have one, um, one repair job done or whatever and then transported it back. So um, if transport becomes more expensive, then we might reconsider if some things need to be done or not. And by becoming expensive or more expensive, by factoring in some of the external costs into the equation, um, the volumes will likely shrink or we decide it's worth it. But I'm sure it might curb it. Governments should please not try to curb it directly, right? That's usually just set the, set the boundaries for not in, this, in the yellow party, but there I would say the market should solve it or could, can solve it if, it if the price is correct, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, as you mentioned, carbon prices are one tool that yeah. could help uh, in that direction. Okay, uh, thank you, my dear panelists. Uh, I think you all deserve a round of applause again. Um, I certainly gained a lot from this discussion, and, and I'm confident that also uh, the on audience online and here um, has many useful takeaways. Um, I think freight transport is gaining in, in visibility in, in the carbon debate, and that's great. No? But please let's all continue pushing together yeah, across uh, countries, across stakeholder groups, yeah, throughout the supply chains for even greater action. Um, I think the freight sector really needs it. Um, so again, thank you also to the audience for your engagement. Um, please stay tuned um, with the transport week because it's not over for today, obviously. Um, <laughs> so before I close, I have to announce what the next session will be about. Um, in 90 minutes from now, so at 2 p.m. Central European summertime, um, we will do something truly global. We will have um, correspondence from each of the four world regions where the Transport Week is happening um, to tell us what the discussions were there, what are the uh, regional trends and actions look like. And they will give you nicely packaged summaries of four days of intensive discussions, so please make sure not to miss it. Daniel Bongard from GIZ and Marusha Kandama from the Slowcat Partnership will also join. Um, so thank you very much, and uh, see you after lunch or after dinner if you're based in Asia. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>